Introduction This is the first in a series of videos examining The Woman King, a historical movie due to be released in September 2022 depicting events in the Kingdom of Dahomey during the late 19th century. At present, in June 2022, there's not a lot of detail available about the plot, but a very brief plot summary has been released, providing some useful details. The plot, as described in the movie's promotional material, does have some historical inconsistencies and inaccuracies, but that's pretty standard for a historical movie, and audiences are accustomed to the necessity of suspension of disbelief in such cases. However, in this case, the subject material is particularly sensitive, addressing topics such as colonialism, imperialism, and the historical enslavement of African people, so it's worth considering the extent to which a historical movie's narrative can legitimately differ from the events it is claiming to depict, especially when its movie's marketing material makes explicit claims of accuracy. This video examines that question addressing these topics. 1. Summary of The Woman King 2. Should history matter to historical movies? 3. Historical inaccuracies in The Woman King. Use the timestamps in the video description to navigate the content. Summary of The Woman King The most commonly found synopsis of the movie, which seems to have been produced by the marketing team, reads thus, quote, The film is inspired by true events that took place in the Kingdom of Dahomey, one of the most powerful states of Africa in the 18th and 19th centuries. Its story follows Naniska, Viola Davis, general of the all-female military unit, and Nawi, Tusombedu, an ambitious recruit, who together fought enemies who violated their honor, enslaved their people, and threatened to destroy everything they've lived for. End quote. Clearly Naniska and Nawi are the heroes of the movie, fighting in defense of their homeland, the Kingdom of Dahomey, against foreign invaders. Given the African context, we may well expect the enemies to be Western imperialists who are invading Dahomey and selling its people into slavery. A description of the movie on another website confirms this, providing the additional information that Naniska and Nawi, quote, fight the French and neighboring towns who have disrespected their honor and enslaved the people of Dahomey and all they live for, end quote. Since the plot is set in Africa, the neighbouring towns presumably belong to another African kingdom which has allied with the French to enslave Dahomey. An article on the movie industry website Looper quotes film producer Cathay Shulman saying, quote, The woman king will tell one of history's greatest forgotten stories from the real world in which we live, where an army of African warrior women staved off slavery, colonialism and intertribal warfare to unify a nation, end quote. The reference to intertribal warfare is noteworthy here, since it's a detail we typically don't find in other commentary on the movie. The same Looper article provides far more detail on the movie's historical context, saying the movie, quote, is based on historical events involving the former kingdom of Dahomey, end quote, and explaining, quote, Dahomey was home to the Dahomey Amazons, an all-female military unit that most likely originated in the 1600s. End quote. The article continues by noting Naniska and Nawi quote, are fictionalized versions of real people, end quote, identifying Naniska as quote, a teenage recruit who joined the Amazons in 1889, end quote, and Nawi as having quote, fought against the French in 1892 during the Second Franco Dahomey War. End quote. This is particularly useful because it helps ground the movie's narrative within a specific historical time period. An article on the Hollywood Reporter website informs us that the movie will feature King Gezo, ruler of Dahomey, to be played by John Boyega. This is another useful historical detail, since King Gezo was a real historical figure. Almost every website with any level of detail about the plot repeats some combination of the same information we've seen in these three sources. Summarized, this is what we've been told the narrative will include. 1. The woman soldiers Naniska and Nawi and King Gezo, ruler of Dahomey. 2. Dahomey's women warriors who defend Dahomey against slavery, colonialism and intertribal warfare 
and unite Dahomey. Three, the Dahomey people being enslaved by both the French and Dahomey's neighboring African states. Until more information is revealed, this is all we have to analyze at present. However, it's enough to start making some assessments of the movie's aims and identifying some historical pitfalls into which it may fall. Should history matter to historical movies? This might seem like an unusual question, since we might assume that history should matter very much to a movie aiming to be historical. However, the aims of entertainment media are not well aligned with the aims of historical education, with the result that historically based movies are typically characterized by some degree of historical inaccuracy. There is an entire cottage industry of historically informed critics taking delight in subjecting movies to scathing analysis, identifying various anachronisms, misrepresented history, or simply historical fabrication. In some cases, these are valid criticisms, while in others, they are little more than complaints about minor details. There is an obvious tension between the narrative and dramatic requirements of a movie and the actual facts of the history it attempts to represent. Good history doesn't always make for a good movie. Additionally, it is widely understood that entertainment is the primary aim and function of movies, rather than education, so we typically don't expect them to have a high degree of historical accuracy. However, historical movies are in a slightly different category, since they are making an explicit claim to represent specific events. Although the oft-used term, based on a true story, is more of a nod to historical events which inspired the movie's plot, rather than an ironclad commitment to representing them accurately, some movies make a stronger claim to historicity, and some even make specific claims to historical accuracy. The debt of accuracy which historical movies owe to the events they depict continues to be discussed and debated in considerable detail by both the movie industry and the historical profession. The issue is complex and requires nuanced analysis and is best served by a separate video. However, for the sake of this video, a few points should be made. Firstly, the woman king is being represented as real history. Promotional material describes it as, quote, a historical epic inspired by the true events that happened in the Kingdom of Dahomey, one of the most powerful states of Africa in the 18th and 19th centuries, end quote. Although the phrase inspired by is clearly intended to avoid a claim to complete historical accuracy, the phrase true events is equally intended to represent the movie's narrative as grounded in real history. Together, these phrases aim to encourage confidence in the movie's historical accuracy rather than diminish it. Secondly, the movie is represented as correcting previous inaccurate representations of the historical events it describes. Cathay Shulman, one of the producers, has called The Woman King, quote, one of history's greatest forgotten stories from the real world in which we live, end quote giving the impression that the movie is depicting long-neglected historical facts. Even more strongly, an article shared on numerous sites, and most likely a form of promotional copy written by the movie's marketing department, informs us that, quote, the film will serve to highlight a piece of history that has been disregarded due to years of colonialist and whitewashed narratives, end quote. This strongly gives the impression that The Woman King is correcting conventional representations of a history which had previously been neglected or distorted through a Western lens. So when it comes to assessing the historical accuracy of The Woman King, we can sidestep most of the debate over the extent to which movies should be held accountable for their representation of history and judge the movie simply on the basis of the claims made for it by the people who made it, acted in it and marketed it. In this case, the claim is that The Woman King is not just historically accurate, it is more historically accurate than earlier depictions of the relevant events. Is this true? Historical inaccuracies in The Woman King It's unclear exactly when The Woman King is set, but we do know that Naniska, Nawi and King Gezo are all represented as contemporaries. We also know that in the movie, Naniska and Nawi, quote, 
fight the French and neighboring towns who have disrespected their honor and enslaved the people of Dahomey and all they live for, end quote. These are useful data points with which to date the movie's events. However, investigating them immediately reveals the woman king's lack of historical accuracy. Now, Niska was a real historical figure for whom there is textual evidence. A French officer recorded her by name in an account of his visit to the capital of Dahomey in 1889. According to his account, she was a teenager at the time, as cited in the movie. This means she must have been born no earlier than 1880. Nawi was also a real historical figure who lived well into the 20th century, dying in 1979 and earning the title of the last of the Dahomey Amazons. Although her birth date is uncertain, she was said to have been well over 100 at the time of death, though this has never been confirmed and other estimates put her simply at 100. Even a generously estimated lifespan of 110 years would still mean she was born no earlier than 1869. Nawi claimed that she had fought the French in 1892, which would have been during the Second franco dahomeyan War. So far, so good. Both Naniska and Nawi were real historical figures, and they were also historical contemporaries. It's entirely possible that they fought side by side, and they may both have fought in the Second franco dahomeyan War, which would agree with representations of the movie which say that Naniska and Nawi, quote, fight the French, end quote. Turning to the history of King Gezo, however, we run into a problem. He died in 1859, so it would have been impossible for either Naniska or Nawi to have ever met him. It's not clear why the movie included Gezo in the plot instead of his successor, Galele. However, even if the movie wants to depict the Second franco dahomeyan War, then even Galele would not have been a good choice, since he died in 1889 before the war started. A better choice would have been Behanzin, originally known as Kondo, who ruled from 1889 to 1894 during the Second franco dahomeyan War. Let's look at some other details. The main feature of the movie is the army of women warriors known as Minon, meaning our mothers. They are sometimes called Ahosi, meaning the king's wives, since they were often recruited from among the king's hundreds of wives but they were typically referred to in the local language as Minon. There are a few problems with their depiction in the movie. Firstly, there's a problem with their clothing. On screen now are some images of the Minon as they are shown in the movie. On their bodies, they are wearing what appears to be some kind of armor made from woven strips of leather. It's in the form of a sleeveless bodice hanging from shoulder straps which are decorated sparsely with small shells and covering the torso all the way down over the hips. Beneath this, the women wear cloth skirts, which end before the knee. They also wear some small breeches, which come down to approximately knee length. How historically accurate are these costumes? Fortunately, we have plenty of evidence with which to assess them. Firstly, we have written descriptions and some hand-drawn illustrations from European colonizers. We can't rely completely on these, however, since we don't know how they've been influenced by cultural bias and prejudice. However, we do have more reliable evidence in the form of actual photographs, including many dating to the era of Gezo, or dating to the era of Naniska, Nawi, and the Second franco dahomeyan War. We do need to take care even with these photos, since even though they may be labelled as depicting the Minon, this identification has often been made by a modern commentator who may have misidentified them. The most reliable photos are those accompanied by text written on them or near them at the same time that the photo was taken, and those showing the Minon in an official context, such as providing demonstrations for the king or posing on parade for foreign visitors to Dahomey. Some photos of the Minon you'll find online are from tours some of the Minon took in Europe, where they performed at ethnic shows or in human zoos. Importantly, they did not go there as slaves or as forced labor, but as willing participants in traveling exhibitions, though they were certainly exploited in the process and represented inhumanely as primitive and barbaric remnants of a bygone era. Nevertheless, they still exercised a certain agency, 
with one financially minded member of the Minon selling nude photographs of herself for cash, and several of the male Dahomey warriors attracting the attention of European women who followed them on tour like groupies and who were often eager to demonstrate their affections physically. Although these tour photos are posed, they are authentic depictions of how the Minon originally looked. They are easily differentiated from inauthentic photos which attempted to copy the success of these so called Dahomey Amazons, sometimes using women of the Ashanti or Yoruba people, and often making poor attempts at copying their clothing and weapons. In some cases, it's clear the fake Amazons are dressed in almost random items of clothing, and the weapons they are holding are clearly local European arms rather than those carried by the actual Minon. The most trustworthy of the European tour photos are those which have been authenticated by modern researchers. On screen now is an example. This is very obviously a posed photograph with the Minon lined up in order facing the camera. Immediately you can see they look very different to how the Minon are dressed in The Woman King. In these original photos, the Minon are wearing a garment with the same kind of shape as the clothing in the movie, but it's made from fabric, not leather. Additionally, the bodice and straps are almost totally covered with small shells rather than just having a few scattered here and there. The skirts they wear are much longer than those in the movie, almost ankle length when standing up and well past the knee when seated. Sometimes the women are shown wearing a shorter skirt down to about the knee when standing, occasionally with long breeches which come down to the knee, and as we've seen, these are shown in the movie. The women are all wearing some kind of headdress in the form of several sets of beads or shells on string. They are also wearing necklaces made from the same shells or beads. This doesn't look very much like the clothing in The Woman King, except for the occasional short skirt and breeches. Now we're actually looking at authentic images of the Minon, we will notice another very obvious difference between them and the women in the movie, their weapons. In The Woman King, the Minon are shown carrying a single sword with a long blade, slightly curved at the end, and without a handguard. These are the only weapons they are shown with. Authentic images of the Minon do show some of them with swords looking quite like those in the movie, but typically show most of them holding very long guns with straps to carry them over the shoulder. These are the weapons for which they were most famous, so it's curious that they aren't seen in the movie's promotional shots. The Minon were organized into different groups, with the front-line troops carrying guns, the second-line troops carrying swords, and the rear-line troops using bows or cannons. Some of the older Minon, who only hunted animals, also wore headdresses with horns. This division of roles isn't seen in any of the movie's promotional shots either. The Minon's guns were single-shot muskets bought from foreign traders, typically the Portuguese, of either the older flintlock type or the more modern percussion cap type. A musket is a long-barreled gun with a smooth inner barrel, or bore, unlike a rifle, which has a groove cut inside the barrel to make the bullet spin, giving it greater range and accuracy. It was not until the late 19th century that the Minon were able to obtain more modern firearms. In fact, by the time of Naniska and Nawi, the Minon were using Winchester rifles, which were state-of-the-art lever-action repeating rifles with a tube magazine containing between 9 and 15 rounds, depending on the model. If the movie is set during the era when Naniska and Nawi lived, then it should show them and the other Minon using these modern rifles, maybe the 1866 Winchester or even the 1892 Winchester, which were made in the United States and purchased in Africa from transatlantic traders. Finally, authentic photos of the Minon sometimes show them accompanied by male warriors standing at the back with more elaborate headdresses. We know the Minon did fight alongside male soldiers. These men have bare torsos covered only by a crossed pair of wide belts made from strung beads or shells. The movie does show these men in some of its promotional shots, but they aren't wearing exactly the same clothes that we see in authentic photos. We don't see the headdress and the straps across the chest are made differently. Here's a summary of the movie's most obvious historical inaccuracies based on what we already know. 1. 
if it's set during the reign of Gezo, then the inclusion of Naniska and Nawi is anachronistic since they lived later than Gezo. 2. If it's set during the time that Naniska and Nawi were alive, then Gezo is anachronistic since he died earlier. 3. Even if it is set during the time of Gezo, the Minon should still be carrying muskets and or flintlock rifles. 4. If it's set during the time of Naniska and Nawi, then they and the other Minon should be carrying Winchester rifles. 5. The costumes look very little like the contemporary records and pictures of the Minon. So, how serious are these historical inaccuracies? I would say they are nearly all insignificant in proportion to the movie's overall narrative. Most of them have no impact on the plot and will only be noticed by the occasional eagle-eyed movie critic or costumers, gun buffs and other people with specialist historical knowledge. I do think that original costumes should be represented accurately since I think that's an important part of cultural representation. I also think it's a serious historical anachronism to make Gezo contemporary with Naniska and Nawi. This is unintuitive to me since I can't think of any reason why they would need such a combination of characters. But perhaps a narrative reason for this will be apparent in the actual movie. Personally, I think it just complicates matters, especially given certain details of Gezo's reign, which I'll address in another video. There's one more historical inaccuracy we need to address, however, and it's the most important one. To me, this is a deal breaker. As I've noted, most of the historical issues with the movie depend on when the plot is set. Do we have any firm information on that? Well, it seems we do. As noted previously, a few websites are reporting it is set during the franco dahomey Wars. One of them says, quote, The French and neighbouring towns who have disrespected their honour and enslaved the people of Dahomey and all they live for, end quote. This may be referring to the first franco dahomeyan War, which only lasted two months, or the second, which lasted two years. This is the movie's most serious historical inaccuracy, and it opens a Pandora's box of issues. The French didn't enslave the Dahomey. There were two wars with the French, but they were started because the Dahomey were attacking and enslaving people in French protectorates. A protectorate was a state which was not a colony or territory owned by France and was partly independently governed, while being ultimately, of course, financially and politically subject to France. In return, these states gained the French army's protection from their African neighbours. This is the main historical issue which promotional material for the woman king never mentions. Although the advertising represents Dahomey as the oppressed victim of enslaving European colonizers, during the 19th century Dahomey was already a powerful empire which had built and continued to preserve its wealth on the conquest of neighboring territories and the enslavement and sale of their people. Dahomey was not only one of the most powerful empires of West Africa, it was also one of the largest and richest suppliers of slaves to the transatlantic slave trade. While the movie's promotional material represents Naniska and Nawi as heroic liberators and defenders of their people against European colonizers, they were also enslavers of African people. In fact, one of the Minon's roles was specifically conducting slave raids on nearby African states in order to supply both Dahomey's lucrative international slave trade and its domestic slave market. Conclusion Some of the people involved in The Woman King are very well aware of these less marketable historical facts. In 2019, Kenyan-Mexican actor Lupita Nyong'o, who was originally cast as Nawi in The Woman King, hosted a documentary called Warrior Women with Lupita Nyong'o, in which she described the history of the Minon, who are referred to as Ogoji in her documentary, 
and specifically raised the awkward issue of their role as slavers. In an interview with Nyong'o, journalist Victoria Sanusi wrote, quote, Lupita hopes viewers will reckon with how complex the Ogoji history truly is, end quote, and explained how, in her documentary, Nyong'o, quote, meets with a woman whose family history has suffered at the hands of the Ogoji women, end quote. Note that in this documentary, the historic kingdom of Dahomey is sometimes referred to by its modern name, Benin. In the documentary, Nyong'o says, quote, the Ogoji women were involved in the slave trade, and that has changed the dynamics and polarization of Benin to this day, end quote, referring to the deeply ingrained social division and bitterness caused in Benin society today by its historic participation in the slave trade. Nyong'o adds, quote, they caused the pain, end quote. The true history of the Minon raises important questions about historical representation and the whitewashing or erasure of unpleasant events, such as slavery and imperialism. This will be examined in the next video in this series. Finally, I'd like to thank my generous patrons, Elias Asvig, Alexander Curzon, Sean A. Young, Andy Chaos, TBLTP, Niels Rethlin, Matthew Simmerall, Thomas Leonard, Ben Lindquist, John Larkin, Ezekiel Stacey, Love You More, Noah French, Aaron Johnson, Emily Kugler, A. David Johnson, B. The Heretic, Sean M., Waymore Odhi, Aubrey Vaughan, and Magic Turtle. Thank you so much for your support, and please contact me if I ever pronounce your name incorrectly.